This is screencast four and the last one for the urinary system lecture. Uh, filtration was pretty complicated. Uh, reabsorption is less so and secretion is even less so. At least I'm not going to be as detailed as it could be. So anyway, tubular reabsorption. Filtration occurs, that first step occurs only at the corpuscle. So filtration is the glomerulus, the capsule, period. From there on, we're going to start reabsorbing stuff, which is taking it back from the tubule, or secreting stuff, which is pushing it out into the tubule. And it's going to be a back and forth. They're not like in order. Filtration's first, and then reabsorption and secretion are going to happen kind of side by side. It can be active or it can be passive. If it's active, you have to spend ATP. If it's passive, it's probably going to follow its concentration gradient. Uh, keep in mind that filtration was passive. You didn't have to spend ATP. All right, first thing we want to get back is sodium. Sodium is uh, important and we actively have to reabsorb it. So this is an ATP requiring process. However, once we power a bunch of sodium back into our tissues, back into our blood and our tissues, that ions, that, that concentration gradient, that buildup of sodium is going to draw a lot of other stuff across that membrane, across that uh, tube wall. Sodium reabsorption takes place everywhere except one little spot, the ascending limb of the loop. So on the way back up that nephron loop, you're not going to absorb any sodium. There's a reason for that that's probably technically a little too uh, complicated, but just suffice it to say that you're going to have a lot of sodium in that area and you're going to let water is going to definitely reabsorb. So we get a salt, we get sodium, I should say, in our tissues, in our blood, and then we start drawing these things back, right? So we start drawing water and glucose and amino acids and other ions and some urea. Now, mind you, urea we were trying to get rid of in the first place. We filtered a lot of that into the tube. Some of it we take back, partially because we can't get rid of it all. Secondly, because it actually helps with that concentration gradient thing again. And it does leave a little bit of urea kind of saturating your kidney tissues. Um, I have the dubious honor of having tasted kidney pie before, and it does taste a little urea-like, but it wasn't bad. Put enough spices in there, you can eat anything. All right, so most of this reabsorption takes place in this proximal convoluted tubule, so you get most of it back pretty quick. Uh, the water comes back everywhere except the ascending limb. So Salt comes back, uh, where am I, where am I, where am I? Um, everywhere except the ascending limb. Water can be reabsorbed everywhere except for the ascending limb. And the distal conflict tube. I gotta add that. And, uh, okay, generally speaking, solutes are reabsorbed everywhere, again, except for the descending limb, most solutes. All right, uh, probably, I'm not gonna beat you down with the details on this. It's just kind of full information. Uh, I'm not gonna really be ultra picky about where stuff's absorbed. Um, do know about this ascending limb thing though. All right, let's look at some hormones that are involved. We've heard of all these before. Uh, aldosterone, I don't need to repeat. Antidiuretic hormone, I don't need to repeat. Atrial natriuretic peptide, I don't need to repeat. Here they are. Parathyroid hormone, I didn't talk about its job in the kidneys, which is to stimulate Calcium reabsorption. I didn't put all the ions, pluses and minuses here. It got a little challenging. So calcium, anyway. So par a parathyroid hormone helps you reabsorb calcium from the filtrate. Next, on to secretion. And by the way, this drawing over here uh, represents both secretion and a reabsorption. So see that the uh, blue is reabsorption, uh, green is secretion. Blah, 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 blah. Here we go. Do, 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 do. What do we secrete? What do we actively put back into the tube? Most of it actively. Uh, I shouldn't say actively put back. What, what do we want to get rid of? Well, we certainly don't want urea. That's our whole purpose, right? And uric acid, these are our two main nitrogenous wastes. So if we've got those milling around out here in the tissues, we're going to start secreting them back into this tubule. So you can see that we're going to push it in there and it's going to go back over here like this, yada, yada, and hopefully be released via this collecting duct, which then will 
uh, merge into those KOCs, which then merges into the pelvis, which then goes to the ureter, as we'll see. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Slow computer. Uh, you, what is your urine? So after filtration, reabsorption, and secretion, we have produced urine. Urine is mostly water and about 5% solutes. Those solutes in order of concentration are urea, sodium, potassium, phosphate, sulfate, creatinine. Creatinine is a breakdown product of, uh, of uh, sorry, of nucleic acids. Uric acids are a breakdown product of proteins and urea is basic carb breakdown product but they don't, they're not all mutually exclusive. And then some more other things. You don't have to memorize this order, but do know that these are all things we're trying to get rid of, right? Urine is basically sterile. Uh, if you've ever noticed that, this is just kind of cool, I guess, um, that urine, f fresh urine, like when you just pee, doesn't really smell really funky. But if you leave it in the toilet overnight and the next morning you open up the toilet on accidentally after having left it, it's got an ammonia smell or if like a cat pees on your shirt, it doesn't smell terrible right away, but then like a week later, it's funky because it ammonifies. There's bacteria that get in there. Uh, slightly acidic, and uh, but this can vary. If this is good survival information, if you're out in the wilderness or on a lifeboat and you're dying of thirst, that when you pee, go ahead and drink it. Uh, but don't just say, oh, I got an internal supply because every time if you drink your first urine, let's say you drank a lot of water on the boat and then the boat sank and now you're on a, love, on a, a lifeboat. If you got to go, it's mostly water and it's sterile. <laughs> but if you got to go again and again and again, you're going to be concentrating that stuff. Your juxtamedullary nephrons are going to be producing a really concentrated urine. At that point, it's not going to be good for you. Uh, here's some stuff you don't want in your urine and some of these names of the conditions. So let's learn these. All right. Glucose, glycosuria, uh, uh, ketone bodies, ketonuria. A lot of them have easy names, right? Hemoglobin, hemoglobinuria. So anyway, learn those. And we're on to our last slide. Any second. There it is. And this is just basic gross anatomy of finishing up. So the kidneys, if you remember way back there, the exit of the kidney is into a tube called a ureter. So this one ureter coming over here from the right kidney, this ureter coming in from the left kidney, and they both enter this structure called the urinary bladder. The urinary bladder is like a big storage bag. They both, the ureters and the bladder, both have smooth muscle in the walls. The urinary bladder muscle, smooth muscle has a name and it's called the, the detrusor muscle. Anyway, that bladder fills up, bloop, 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 bloop. And eventually it starts to signal you that you've got, you know, there's stretch receptors in the walls and they'll say, you got to go, right? Well, luckily you've got a little internal sphincter. There's a little, what's called an internal urethral sphincter right there, right by the bladder. And then an external urethral sphincter a little bit farther along. This internal one is involuntary. That means that if you're like, when I'm sitting here right now, I don't have to go. My bladder may have a little bit of urine in it, but it's closed because of this internal urethral sphincter. Now, if you've ever gone on a long road trip and you had, you know, a Gatorade right before you left and you're about an hour or two into it and you go, you're like, I got to stop. Where's the next rest stop? And it's, you know, still says 10 miles away. Oh, I got to hurry. At some point, this internal sphincter is going to give up. And at that point, I hope you have a strong external urethral sphincter because that's the you've had that feeling before where you're like oh no right and you're really kind of you know pinching it off <laughs> it literally with this sphincter uh, and then you hope you make it to the rest stop anyway once it exits there it enters the urethra males have a longer urethra than females uh, because they have a copulatory organ here called a penis that requires the urethra to go down it before it gets to the outside one Benefit of that is it makes males less likely to get urogenital uh, or urinary tract infections because if bacteria get in here, they may be moving and growing up this tube, but there's a better chance that a male will have to go pee and the bacteria won't have made it into the bladder 
uh, because they have to go up this urethra. Females have a shorter uh, urethra and therefore it's easier for the bacteria to get in there. The process of urination has a technical name called, so peeing has a technical name called urination, which has an even more technical name called micturition. Anyway, that's all I got. Uh, let me know if you have any questions, okay? If you're confused about this stuff, email me.